being extended are true. Uh, my name is Regina Valdez, and I'm the program director for Climate Reality Project in New York City, as well as a climate reality leader and mentor, Green Faith Fellow, and lead Green Associate. And tonight we offer you a COP26 recap where our panelists will discuss whether this COP has been the success that the world had hoped for or if instead a lot of blah, 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 as stated by Greta Thunberg. We're gonna begin by hearing from Dr. Peter Carter who is joining us via video. Dr. Carter is a medically qualified doctor with a background in environmental health policy. He is the director of the Climate Emergency Institute, as well as an IPCC expert reviewer and co-author of Unprecedented Crime, Climate Science Denial, and Game Changers for Survival. So without further ado, let's roll the tape. Today, the 10th of November, Glasgow, COP26, we received the first draft of what will be the uh, concluding document of the uh, conference. So as inevitably because of, particularly because of the voting system of the UN uh, climate conferences, um, these will be, this will be negotiated down. This is the best that we're going to receive from COP26. And um, it really wasn't any good in any case. It uh, acknowledged the climate and biodiversity crisis, should have called it emergency. Um, it acknowledged that uh, emissions had to be reduced, global emissions had to be reduced rapidly, didn't say immediately as the um, IPCC chair. And it said, and this was good if it stays in, and I don't think much of this will stay in because the fossil fuel uh, promoting, supporting, producing uh, countries will not allow it. But they did say that the emissions, global emissions of carbon dioxide have to be reduced what amounts to 50% from uh, 2020 by 2030. So it'll be interesting to see if that stays in. Um, uh, there was a lot of uh, blah, blah, blah. There was a lot of uh, excuses and urging um, uh, countries to honor their, uh, their obligations under the 1992 convention that the long industrialized countries have never honored. So um, this says we will do, we promise to, um, uh, and uh, we urge that we do a lot of blah, blah, blah and reflects the fact that um, the, um, the, uh, the long industrialized countries with a lot of money um, uh, still refuse to meet their obligations to the uh, most climate change vulnerable and least developed countries. And that is absolutely awful. Um, uh, morally is so unbelievably unjust and it's an obstruction to progress in the convention. So um, there was nothing that will result in global emissions of carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases to decline one bit, nothing. Um, no carbon pricing, no greenhouse gas pollution pricing, uh, no termination of fossil fuel subsidies, just a comment that they should be phased out. Well, the uh, G20 agreed to end fossil fuel subsidies back in 2009 at their Pittsburgh summit. And uh, this uh, COP draft text says that they are still not going to do this. That is a crime of all time. And uh, already uh, observers are saying, well, we're going to have to wait yet another year to the COP27. So the best thing, I think, that came out of the COP was that Greta Thunberg and her team of international youth uh, climate advocates and activists, they sent a petition, um, it's online, a formal petition to the United Nations General Assembly to the Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who has been so good on climate. And they have sent their petition that the United Nations General Assembly must make a climate emergency declaration statement. Now that is absolutely, totally the best thing because that's something that we can all get behind. The whole world can get behind this petition made by the best of our youth, led by Greta. We can all do that. 
that could really get things moving because we've been told that now we have to wait for another year to the next COP27 in Egypt before anything can happen. No, um, uh, we have to have a massive movement to force all of the governments, to force the world economy to change and get real and do what we need has to be done. And that's very simply terminate fossil fuel subsidies immediately. Everybody knows that. Of course, it wasn't there. Um, uh, tax, charge, fee, the big polluters and make it a realistic charge. In my view, it should, it should start at $100 per ton and increase at least 10% every year. Without those two things, we have no future. With those two things, if we can force them to happen, then we could. So that's it as I see it. Wow, okay, so another cop of kicking the can down the road. Um, and I see we have one vote already for blah, blah, blah uh, from Peter Carter. Uh, next on our panel, I'd like to introduce Nick Brees. Nick is a climate communicator who has written and produced filmed interviews with over 200 climate change experts. He contributes regularly to The Ecologist and Climate Gen, if I pronounce that correctly, okay. He is co-founder of the Cambridge Climate Lecture Series. So Dr. Carter states that there is nothing in this COP will lead in any real way to greenhouse gas emission decline. Um, I'm wondering what have been your observations in the last two weeks, Nick? Okay, I'll read you my notes. And in the last couple of weeks, we've endured the usual pomp and circumstance of the UNFCCC COP meetings with world leaders and billionaires flying in to share their pearls of wisdom. The trouble is that emissions are still going up. The largest polluters are consuming what remains of carbon budgets that tell us what we can burn to stay within the boundaries of the Paris Agreement, leaving very little for the poorest countries, many of whom are facing the worst impacts of climate change even today. Promises made over the last decades have been routinely broken, meaning that trust has evaporated from the COP process. The least developed countries or most affected people in areas are being sacrificed first to satiate the appetites of us in the high consuming nations. The fingerprint of climate change can now be found in every region of the world and the extremes are coming at us on an exponential trajectory. A growing number of us now realize that we are all equally at risk and that wealth is an unreliable buffer to extreme climate impacts. It is now confirmed that the snow cover of the European Alps is beyond saving and will be gone this century. The Greenland ice sheet, even if we hold to the Paris 1.5 degrees C, is beyond its threshold of viability. The loss of Arctic sea ice is a huge weather destabilizing threat that could cripple global food production, which in turn is directly related or correlated to conflict. Our attitude towards climate migrants is that they pretty much disgust us and should be left to die. We are intelligent but not wise, facing this huge cataclysmic threat. The COP itself is fronted by world leaders who like the photo opportunities but shirk the responsibilities of the offices they hold. The incumbent UK government is truly a leader in double speak, claiming to be acting in our best interests while actually throwing our collective safety under the fast moving bus. And many other nations are no better. Among the comments I've heard from the science and academic community this week have been, if we don't fix the climate issue, it literally means the end of our civilization. Another one said, we're going to hell in a hand cut. Just last night, a former White House advisor said to me after a glass of wine, we are fried. While the former UK government science advisor said twice this week on the record, if we don't save the Arctic, we are cooked. And given the Arctic is past its own tipping point, that means we have to intervene. The underlying truth here is that the COP is not going to save us. The anger palpable in the streets is justified because the expectation gap is large. We are witnessing the agency with which we entrust to our leaders passing back to the people. We can no longer outsource the work of living within our planetary boundaries and restoring our planet. In conclusion, the 250 million pounds spent on policing this event could have been better used to develop citizens assemblies at the local, national and international level. Because after 26 years of climate policy failure, more than that really, uh, emissions are still rising and we need to find another way. Indeed we do. Um, so I have another vote for blah, 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 it seems. Okay, so far I'm seeing a trend. 
Um, thank you so much, Nick. Um, and now I'd like to introduce uh, Paul Beckwith. Paul is a climate system scientist who was taught at the University of Ottawa and the Laboratory for Paleoclimatology, as well as at Carleton University. Paul is a well-known climate educator on YouTube with over 1,000 videos pertaining to climate science. Uh, so, Paul, what are your thoughts on the last two weeks here at COP? Well, <clears throat> extreme weather events are increasing in frequency, severity, and duration around the planet. And they're occurring, you know, we're getting uh, severe events occurring in places where they never occurred before. And the Arctic was mentioned, that's the root cause, the great warming of the Arctic has upset the balance of, the, of heat on the planet, of how heat is transported from the equatorial regions to the poles via the oceans and atmosphere. Um, we basically changed the system of uh, jet streams and air currents in the atmosphere and we've changed the ocean currents and we're heading to complete loss of Arctic sea ice um, which will result in much greater warming of the Arctic than anything we've seen yet and I think that this will severely disrupt uh, global food supplies causing geopolitical conflict, uh, huge price spikes in food, and uh, probably famine. Jacobabad, Pakistan was 125 degrees Fahrenheit this summer, which is 51 and two-thirds degrees Celsius. You know, you say, okay, well, that's Pakistan, it's always hot there, but British Columbia and Canada reached 49.6 degrees, and this was quite far, uh, this was quite high latitude. Um, and that happened for three or four days in a row, and then the town of Lytton, uh, British Columbia, burned down, and we saw, you know, uh, Paradise, California, burned down a few years ago. So these sort of events are going to increase. Uh, we're going to see more of them, and there's, it's written into the system already. We can't stop that. But what have we done in COP? Well, some things have been done. I mean, methane emissions down 30% by 2030 has been agreed upon by, um, by many countries, but not all countries are there, uh, notably China and India. Deforestation is supposed to stop by 2030. Uh, more money pledged for adaptation, yet previous pledges that we've seen in other COPs have not been met. And just yesterday, we got a little bit of a spice, uh, spice news. Uh, the US and China have agreed to slow emissions by 2030. So, you know, maybe incrementally some things are being done, but not to the urgency that we demand and require in order to save this planet. You know, the politicians and world leaders seem to be the last ones to be understanding the extent and of this climate emergency that we're in. You know, walking the streets of Glasgow, there's posters everywhere talking about the climate emergency. Uh, I've seen urgency levels notched up, way, way up, um, since Paris and Madrid and Lima, Peru, since those cops. Um, but that's, ur those urgency levels are in the general public that is outside the cop in the youth. You know, young people are literally in tears fighting for their lives and they don't see um, the, they don't see action strong enough to give them, you know, a lot of hope for the future. You know, lots of young women are refusing to even consider the idea of having children. I mean, how serious and how sad is that? They don't think that there will be a decent world for them to bring up their kids in. And as Peter and Nick said, as long as greenhouse gases continue to climb exponentially in the atmosphere, and as long as our governments continue to subsidize the fossil fuel industry, and as long as we have meetings, COP meetings, where there's actually more fossil fuel lobbyists in the blue zone than there are delegates of any other country, any country, um, then, you know, this is a, um, the, the house is rigged, if you like. The system is rigged and it's not honestly dealing with the uh, severe threat that we face from abrupt climate change. 
Thank you so much, Paul. Um, I, I, I like what you said about the House being rigged because it brings me back to our one of our first talks here, the climate casino and, and how the House always wins. And of course, that's the fossil fuel industry. And of course, they're at every corner of this cop. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Rupert Reed. Rupert is an associate professor of philosophy at the University of East Anglia and author of Parents for Future. Uh, it's either come out or will come out in 2021? Oh, it's out. Okay, it's out. And uh, he's also co-editor with Jim Bendel of Deep Adaptation, Navigating the Realities of Climate Chaos. And this is the first book ever written on deep adaptation. He's also the co-founder of transformativeadaptation.com. So Rupert, we'd like to hear from you. So I want to make a bold claim, but I think it's true. This COP will go down in history as the COP that killed 1.5 degrees. It is not true that 1.5 degrees has been kept alive by this COP. It's not even on life support as far as I'm concerned. The analyses of the Climate Action Tracker and the UNEP Emissions Gap Report addendum are clearly showing that when you take into account what is realistically offered by this COP, then we are heading for closer to three degrees. And it is no longer possible to let them credibly get away with saying that that's a way of keeping 1.5 degrees alive. When I read the draft agreement the other day, I was actually shocked. I've got to admit it to you. I, I'm, I feel almost scandalized about myself to say that because I've been warning for months about how ineffectual this COP was going to be. But even I wasn't expecting something as, as vapid as the actual document. There's basically nothing in it. Nothing by way of commitments. All it says is we want to try and do this, that and the other in the future. It is it is simply an exercise in kicking the can down the road. That's it. And given that, we must conclude that 1.5 degrees is no longer credible. And this is, a, this is a terrible thing to have to say. But I think it's nothing but the truth. So because of the recalcitrance of a substantial number of countries, COP26 has failed us, and it has failed our children who are left begging for their lives. And in the light of that, I want to raise a couple of uncomfortable questions. First question is this. Yeah, sure, we can point our fingers at the fossil fuel industry, obviously, and at the countries failing to show leadership, and there are other villains as well. But what about our own role in this, does it actually make sense to be part of a process which is so direly off the pace? Are those of us who have been strong critics of this COP, of the COP process, of the recalcitrance of those countries and so forth, are we nevertheless in some sense legitimating the process by way of being here? even as we sit here in this press conference. I'm not honestly sure what the answer to this question is, but it seems to me that we have reached the point where we need to ask a, a question like that. We have reached a point where we need to no longer assume that taking part in this can-kicking exercise actually makes sense. And my second uncomfortable question is this. Well, if there's anything right about my first uncomfortable question, well, should there be further elements to this can-kicking exercise? Should we be all, be all assuming that, well, of course, there'll be a, a COP27 at Cairo and then a COP28 and so forth? Is that also now potentially part of the problem rather than of the solution? Should there be more COPs? It will be said in response, but look, I mean, the COP process may be dire, but it's better than having no process at all, and it does at least supply some kind of legitimacy in international law to claims from protesters in, in courts and so forth. 
But we, what I'm saying is we have to make an honest assessment. Do the benefits at this point actually outweigh the costs? Would it be better to say it's not one minute to midnight, it's not minute, it's not midnight, it's five past midnight. The COP system has failed. Arguably, it was designed to fail. It never had any sanctions built into it, as, for example, the Montreal Protocol did. There was never any way of enforcing anything that's been happening in these last 25 years. Should it, should it actually carry on? So that's my second uncomfortable question. And my, now my conclusion. If you think that anything that I've said is true, then we must take the first steps of fully claiming our agency and no longer outsourcing it to governments and to a process who are clearly not intending to use it to save us. And what's the implication of that? Well, right here in Glasgow, we need to find some strong way of asserting that. We need to find some strong way of asserting that we recognize, I'm going to use a bit of sort of copy language here, that we recognize that it's five minutes past midnight, that we recognize that we acknowledge that our governments are not planning to save us, and that we intend to take back the power that they have abdicated using. And what that means in very small micro terms, it seems to me, in the next couple of days as this COP comes towards a close, is that not just outside the blue zone, but inside the blue zone, we should consider protesting. We should consider walking out. We should consider joining those who are outside the exits. We should consider joining those who are going to be protesting in London on Saturday. We must mark and narrate this infamous moment in human history the moment where 1.5 became consigned to history and where it became clear that no one's coming, no one's coming, no one's coming to save us. Thank you for that sober assessment, Reed, and those, uh, Rupert, and those questions that you ask are um, indeed questions I've been asking myself. And it's um, definitely very important to ponder upon. I, too, have been wondering if um, this is all one big charade that we're partaking in. And, and you mentioned mourning. And, and when I hear that word and I hear your uh, idea that you know, we've passed 1.5 and on the pathway to 3 degrees, how then do we deal with this? The, the idea of mourning and the youth that we've let down so much, the youth that is supposed to be filled with promise and hope for the future, when yet they're looking for forward with a sense of mourning. Mm. How do we prepare them? How do we support them? What would our role be, do you think, Rupert? Yeah, well, I think that's a great question. Um, there's obviously much that I haven't said in my, in my brief remarks, and the same for my excellent colleagues here. Um, one uh, unsaid implication is there needs to be a much bigger pivot to adaptation if what we're saying is right, because you know the shit's coming down the pike at us, so we're going to have to prepare for it. But another, as you say, is there's going to be a great deal of suffering uh, of a psychological kind, as well as of a more obvious physical kind, as a result of the non-decisions being made here, and that kind of pain that eco-grief, that eco-anxiety, that requirement for mourning. We're going to have to find ways of supporting that and facilitating that. My own view is that that is actually now one of our best uh, hopes also, that we could um, find some better way of going forward from the, the terrible state that we're in <coughs> as, a, as a species right now, frankly. Um, in other words, I think that these painful emotions, if you allow yourself to really experience them, to really face the grief, the anxiety, uh, the anger, um, the horror, um, they give you an immense power. That, that power is what has fueled Extinction Rebellion. That power is what has fueled Greta. And I think we've only just started to, to really taste and feel that power. So if we're looking for hope 
uh, in this desolate situation. I think the hope comes from precisely being willing to feel and go through that mourning process. Thank you, thank you, Rupert. Um, Nick, I just wanted to, um, you had mentioned this former White House advisor who had, um, had shared with you, quote, we are fried. And it seemed um, like such a, uh, pardon me for being slightly judgmental, but it seemed like um, uh, somewhat of a craven admission. And I'm just wondering how many people do you believe um, in the United States government, in the House, the um, how many people actually know how serious the situation is, yet is keeping silent about it? In terms of the US, I wouldn't have an idea, but in terms of the COP, I think I've had many candid conversations with people and everyone is very downbeat and very resigned to the inaction that's taking place. Um, and everyone's asking, you know, what next? What else can we do? So I think, you know, an adaptation, regeneration, these kinds of things now have to be looked at and accelerated, ramped up. And it'll be the agency, as been mentioned here, of individuals and organizations, communities that probably do it. So it'll be bottom up and not top down. It's really hard. It's, it's, this is such an uh, all-encompassing uh, travesty. And, and to really take in how much our leaders have failed us, it is tremendously grieving. It truly is. Um, Paul, in regards to the, to the science, I know that I, I've seen you quite a lot in the Arctic Pavilion, and uh, one of the talks there, um, A Tale of Two Ice Sheets, I particularly resonated with me, uh, the Greenland Ice Sheet and the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, um, and, and the rapid heating and the acceleration of the um, ice, uh, of the Arctic ice is going to have grave consequences. And, you know, the idea of, of people, um, climate refugees, um, having, losing their very homes is something that's quite real. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that and Yeah, ideas. I, I think, um, you know, as bad as we think things are right now, I think the climate is just, uh, pardon my, my expression, but it's just getting warmed up. I mean, the extreme weather events, the catastrophes that it's throwing at us, these things that are so unexpected to people, and I have that in quotes, unexpected, you know, that, that, this is just the beginning, okay? I mean, we still have ice up in the Arctic. When we have no ice in the Arctic, the temperatures will literally skyrocket in the Arctic. They will rapidly climb and further cause complete disruption of the ocean currents and atmosphere and the way heat has moved on the planet. And we won't recognize our planet soon, you know, so there'll be a scramble within countries to, um, you know, survive this thing because it's, uh, it's, it's going to get uh, a lot worse than it is now, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, we have to prepare ourselves for that. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you for everyone on our panel. I wish that we had better news for you, but it seems like COP26 is blah, blah, blah. Um, not so much good has come out of it, and um, we all have to embark on the journey of mourning so that we can get to the other side and begin with action and adaptation. But I do want to thank you all for staying through this talk. It hasn't been easy. Um, so thank you, thank you for being here tonight. I also want to thank uh, the organizations that have made this talk uh, possible, and that is the Buddhist Tsuchi Foundation, the Interfaith Center for Sustainable Development, the International Society for Ecological Economics and Sustainable Population, and Sustainable Population Australia. So thank you so much, everyone, and have a good cop. <laughs>